Good morning. Good morning. I'll say it again. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to all that are here. Um, just, just one quick thing for all of you who are kind of like OCD and see a big hole in the middle of the um, sanctuary with the chairs. Just don't worry. I'll blame it on Tim. Pastor Tim is going to come up. He's going to explain what's going on there. So just I didn't want you to be distracted too much as we get started here this morning. Welcome to our service. We love to have you here. We love to be together, to worship together, to listen to God's word, um, to just praise and worship together. Will you stand with me and with us? From Psalm 105, the psalmist says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all of his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Let me say that last part. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Let's seek the Lord. Let our hearts seek the Lord this morning. And let's rejoice in him together. Please sing with us. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. Come on, sing it out. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see. standing with us now, Lord, unveil our eyes. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Come on, lift it up. Open up the heavens. We want to see
with me, oh God, we thank you so much for your love, for your mercy, for your grace. We stand here, oh God, with our hearts open wide, lifting our hands, lifting our voices in love and gratitude for you. We thank you for Jesus, Lord, and his sacrifice for us. And though we lift our songs and our voices, we know that nothing that we can say could really ever come close to your greatness, could really ever come close to expressing how much we're thankful and how much you deserve. But, oh, Lord, this morning we are going to try for sure. We sing our gratitude. We sing our praise. We sing your truth. God, accept our worship today. Lord, we love you. No, my words fall short. I've got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I Every song I'll stand, and you never do. No, you don't. So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a Nothing else fit for a king 
Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Sing hallelujah to you this morning. seats around, but I do apologize a little bit because I know how disconcerting it is to come and expect to see something someplace and it's not there. This morning, we wanted to create some space for some spontaneity, um, for some prayer. So we're going to take some time this morning to pray. And well, let, let me just introduce it a little bit here. We, we know about Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. It's, it's very famous. Of course, verse 16 stands out to us very, very strongly. But earlier in the conversation, Jesus says this to Nicodemus. I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. When the Spirit moves, we, we, have, to, we have to be available. It's a little like being on call. Some of you know what that feels like with your work. But this morning, we'd like to just take some time. We'd like to pray. And, and let me assure you, you know, you can do this whatever way is comfortable to you. Maybe you're most comfortable praying alone. That's great. Maybe you'd like to just pray with the person next to you, whether it's a family member or whatever it is. That's fine or a small group that you're surrounded by. That's awesome, too. The space that we made was, if you'd like to pray in a larger group, that's great. We have space up here, back there, in the, in the four corners, some in the middle here, you've already noticed, and some over here on the side, some over here on this aisle. Um, and maybe, maybe when it comes to this kind of a open-ended thing, that leaves you uncomfortable, too. I put some some of our prayer updates around, if, if you're, you're going, I don't know what to pray about. I don't, I don't know what to do with this. So, you know, just, that's fine. Just grab the prayer update and, and use that. But I hope that many of you will take the time to pray together about what's going on in your life. About the things that are of concern to you right now or things that you're, you're praising God for. I hope you'll take time for that. As we do get ready to pray, I wanted to, to just talk about that. Um, back in ancient Rome, in uh, the second century, the Christians were being persecuted a great deal, and many of them, many of them went to the underground. They went to the catacombs to, to worship. And when you go through the catacombs, there, there's some places where they carved pictures of people praying. And it's kind of interesting because we, we think of this or this, but the pictures show this. And the Bible talks a lot about raising your hands. It talks about throwing yourself on the floor, prostrating yourself, or kneeling, or, or any number of things. And of course, we know it's not about the position of your body, but about the condition of your heart. And so there's no prescription. But I do want there to be freedom. Freedom. As we pray this morning, feel free to move around. We tried to make space for that. Feel free to get together. Feel free to just sit where you are and pray on your own. But do pray. 
Talk to God. Cry out to Him. Give Him your heart. Come on, see where the wind blows us. Let's stand again.
praise His name. Praise the take our offerings, Lord. We hold them in our hands, but not tightly at all, and we give them to you, O oh God. You're the maker and creator of all that we are and all that we see around us and all that we don't even see. Lord, you own it all, and you've given us so much. We wish to just give back to you to acknowledge that, to acknowledge who you are, Lord. Because we know that you provide it all. You provide everything for us. And you've been so good. So we give to you out of what you've given us. Lord, take these things and use them for your good and for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated and the ushers can come forward for the offering. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, we're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on the Savior, to fall on your grace. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. We're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down, as your people sing. We will rise with you, lifted on your wings. And the world will see that our God saves, our God saves, there is hope in your name. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Son, 
name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. We're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down, as your people sing. We will rise with you, lifted on your wings, and the world will see that our God saves, our God saves, there is hope in your name. Morning turns, and morning turns. the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down as your people sing we will rise with you lifted on your wings and the world will see that yes the world will see are great. We love to worship with you. We love to praise our God with you. So, uh, Pastor Tim, you're up, and the children are dismissed for your Sunday services. Go and have a good time and be enriched and be fulfilled and love the Lord together with your people. You see that slide up there. Um, we're, we're doing this slide these days to kind of make the transition more smooth. We're always trying to find better ways to do things if we can. Eventually, you won't even hear us say it anymore. It'll just be the slide. Might not be that long. I don't know. It depends on how long it takes me to come to, you know, grips with what I'm supposed to be doing. Let me read you a story. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death, for it is the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. After that, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you're going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, 
but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us go, that we may die with him. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been to the tomb, in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brothers. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus deeply moved again came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around so they might believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said, unbind him. Let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary, had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. We'll stop the story there. Lazarus rising from the dead inspires us as it reminds us that Jesus has the power over life and death. He truly does deserve the glory he gets. Not because of Lazarus specifically, though though that's certainly a good reason to give him a lot of recognition. No, other prophets had raised the dead and would do so again. Paul, Elisha, Elijah. But Jesus demonstrates this ability multiple times in his life. And in this case, it takes place four days after Lazarus' death. Jesus is making a point. We can understand Martha's reluctance about rolling the stone away 
The other res resurrections in the Bible took place immediately after the person had died. Jesus not only gives life to Lazarus, he reverses the decomposition process. He delayed his arrival to establish Lazarus' death significantly before he arrived. And this story pushes the envelope of credibility. I mean, how can this story even be true? Miracles have very little place in the modern, enlightened, scientific mind. When Thomas Jefferson edited the Gospel and, and put out his own edition of it, he took this story and most of the miracles out. Many people who read these stories of miracles, they like to relegate them to the symbolic or the apocryphal. They have meaning, they would say. But they're not literally true. I have a friend who says he witnessed a resurrection. I confess I don't believe him. Not because I think he's lying. I think he's interpreting what he saw in a way that, that gets spiritual mileage. And, and I love the man. I love him an awful lot. And yet I think that probably the man hadn't actually died. Uh, you know, it, it's me. I, and I admit, I feel hypocritical in even thinking this. If Jesus and other prophets can raise the dead, why can't it happen now? It can, but I struggle with the reality of it when it comes right down to it. It's easier to believe that it happened 2,000 years ago and under the hand of Jesus himself but some people struggle even with that. And finally, the idea that Lazarus rose from the dead is a source of frustration. How many people have lost somebody that they loved and begged and prayed and wished and bargained for it not to be so? If I was a gambling man, I would bet that there was somebody in this room who had prayed, Jesus, you raised other people from the dead. You can raise this person too. How many very bad people live while good people die? Which of us has not lost someone dearly loved and couldn't see any reason why they shouldn't be raised and, and maybe some of these bad people dead instead? Why should Mary and Martha get their brother back and we don't get our loved one? Our mothers, our wives, our husbands, our children, our fathers. So when Jesus tells Lazarus to come out of the tomb, we are amazed, of course. But at the same time, we can be skeptical and we might even be a little resentful. Jesus didn't have to do this. He delayed more than necessary just to make the point. Even after he received word and knew the reason that he had been told, he waited two days before even leaving where he was, and then he proceeded at a leisurely pace. Now, Jesus had already polarized the population. He had believers. He had detractors. He was unlikely to tip the balance with another miracle. I mean, he had done a lot of miracles, and and people were pretty well entrenched in their viewpoints. But he challenged people that if they couldn't believe what he said, based on the power of the words themselves, he said, believe the miracles. See if then you can find a reason for belief. And we do this all the time. We think, God, if God does this or that, our faith would be strengthened. And it isn't because God didn't say compelling things. Of course he did. It's because we want to be convinced by more than just words. And do we think sometimes that by believing, we're doing God a favor? If he wants our faith, he'll have to earn it. And then, if we admit the truth of the way we are, and, and as long as I feel like it, I'll give that faith. But let me just say, Jesus is not interested in submitting an application for your approval. 
What he wants is an acknowledgement of the truth to take his appropriate place in our hearts as the one who gave us life, who created us, the master of our lives. He is not applying to be your co-pilot. He's the owner of the fleet. Amen. And Jesus raised a man from the dead knowing there would be people to use this most loving and generous miracle to declare their opposition to him and further their goals to kill him. I mean, can't you just hear the conversation? We read it. People went and told the Pharisees. And, and so they go to a priest and, and the priest says, he what? And the messenger says, well, he raised a man from the dead. Yeah, it has to be a trick. No trick. The guy had been dead four days. And the priest is going, so no question it was a miracle. And the messenger says, no question. And the priest says, so how did the people respond? And the messenger said, well, some were frightened, maybe, but most were amazed. And the man's sisters, of course, were overjoyed to have him back. This will not do. The man must die. Sure. And Jesus, even knowing that giving life would make him enemies, did it anyhow. And this is proof of Jesus' deity. His foreknowledge. His understanding and patience with human nature. His ability to give life. But he was also human. Even the power and hope Jesus embodied did not stop him from being moved by death. Jesus wept. is not only remembered as the shortest verse in the Bible. It's also remembered because it shows us a side of Jesus that leans heavily on his humanity. Why did Jesus weep? And the easier answer it's because his friend, his cousin, had died. But there's more to it than that. The very bald and simple statement of verse 35 sometimes causes us to miss the more complex statement of verse 33. Jesus was moved by the tears of the mourners, Mary's tears, the impulses that led to Lazarus being buried. He was more than grieving. He was troubled. It's like the tears that we cry when we know things are going badly for someone, but we think and probably even know a little bit that it's going to be okay. We feel their pain. We've been there and we know the darkness that comes with their struggle. Grief is deeply visceral. It does us no good at all to deny it. I do believe that Jesus grieved. Deep inside the human spirit, there is a need for God. We can't see Him. And we have a hard time sometimes even believing in Him. We limit Him to what we can understand because we limit God. We're still bound to the hardships of this life, not realizing that they do not bind God. But we need Him. And we know He's bigger and all that. And, and we see Him as bigger. We need Him to be bigger. But it's still hard for us to accept. I'd venture to say that for most of us, faith is the biggest battle that most of us fight. Jesus wept because even though Mary and Martha had a strong belief in him, their belief was not enough to see past their current situation to the possibilities that Jesus represented. They saw him as a healer, but their understanding of him was limited to that level of life-giving power. To Martha, he might have said, there is no difference between this life and the afterlife. The same power that provides for one provides for the other. Both are just as real. We must be awake to the truth that something much bigger is at stake. We overvalue the importance of the continuation of this life. It's what we see, it's what we know, so it strikes us as the most valuable thing, but it's not. Look at what Jesus said. Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? When Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead, it was a means to an end. Now, I don't believe, I'm not trying to say that Jesus thought that Lazarus' life was unimportant. No. But the glory of God was much more to the point. 
the main thing that brought God glory was not that Lazarus had been dead four days and was now alive again, but the thing that resurrection proved that they might believe you sent me. Jesus prayed out loud so the people standing around would understand the cause of what they were about to see. They could they could go they could they couldn't go away from that saying that Jesus presence in this was incidental. Jesus direct connection with the Father was proved by the power that he showed by bringing Lazarus to life. That connection showed that what Jesus said was true. God sent him into the world. So when Jesus diverted the glory to God, it was validated by his connection to God. It wasn't just sleight of hand. It wasn't just to distract what he was really up to. Look at the order of importance that Jesus places on these things. Lazarus gains life, which proves that Jesus was sent by God, which, in turn, brings glory to God. We still tend to misunderstand Jesus' power. Jesus loves us. He wants our lives to be good. But our definition of good and His definition of good are sometimes at odds. We think the good life is comfortable, without trouble, meaningful, happy, pain-free as possible, perhaps even virtuous and generous. Jesus thinks a good life is one that brings God glory. So while Jesus' miracles may in fact ease people's trouble, it might give their lives meaning, it might make them happy or comfortable or relieve their pain or facilitate their virtue and generosity. And these results, though, are only incidental, a means to an end. If Jesus could have achieved His end another way, He might have done it. The truth is, that Jesus does miracles to bring God glory. And this is a case in point. Lazarus coming back from the grave. It made Mary and Martha happy. It extended Lazarus' life. But those things have all gone away now. Lazarus died again. We don't know if he died before Mary and Martha. If he did, they grieved again. His life is now over. And His resurrection amazes us. But it doesn't make us particularly happy. We're kind of disconnected. We're more likely to derive frustration from it. If Lazarus can live again, why not my loved one? But His ultimate goal, Jesus' ultimate goal, is God's glory. That's why. The conversation in Jerusalem is part of the story. This miracle, while giving Lazarus life, galvanized Jesus' death. Both giving Lazarus life and Jesus giving up his own life brought glory to God. And Jesus was comfortable with either scenario. And in actual fact, both scenarios. So what do we do with this miracle? We remember this. The fact that Jesus can do something does not mean that he will do it. And it doesn't mean that it's the best possible answer to the problem. We might walk away from the situation knowing Jesus has power over life and He's willing to exert power for people in some circumstances. And if so, why not us? If we're good enough, if we do the right things or say the right words, wouldn't Jesus give us such a wonderful gift? Of course, the flip side of that logic is that if Jesus doesn't do it, then we weren't good enough and we said the wrong things. But these two things are unrelated. Jesus wants God's glory. The key to seeing the miraculous happening is learning to understand what will most bring God glory. The thing that will bring God glory may not be the same thing that makes my life easier or more comfortable or happier. It may be suffering. It may be very mundane service. But if God's glory is our highest goal, as it was His highest goal, that will be okay with us. Perhaps with some (laughs) self-persuasion, sometimes we might have to talk ourselves into it. Okay, God, you won't give me a miracle, but I'll keep serving, I'll keep suffering if that's what you want and if that's what gives you glory. And that eventually will come to us to be okay. 
But this story is at its core about a man's life. When Jesus entered the situation, he told Martha her brother would live again. She believed Jesus was talking about the final resurrection. And the reality of Lazarus' restored earthly life did not negate the truth of what Martha believed. Nearly nobody, almost nobody, experiences this kind of a radical resurrection. It is it is exceptional in the extreme. However, everyone will be raised on the last day. And the spiritual life that Jesus brings here and now is more immediate. It goes back to God's glory. That moment in time, that circumstance made Lazarus' physical life a God-glorifying moment. Enough to bring about a radical exception to the rule. But Martha's observation is important for us. We know that on the last day, we too will be raised. Even in our death, Jesus is powerful and overcomes. Physical death is a temporary state of affairs. We need not think, we should not think, we dare not think that death on this earth is the last word. Some of what Jesus was trying to communicate in his actions was the same power it took for Lazarus to rise from the dead will be the power that he exerts to raise everyone from the dead. No matter how long they've been gone or what circumstances they died in. John also wrote this in Revelation chapter 20, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Judgment is at the end, but a life that glorifies God is an important factor in that judgment. The next couple of verses in this passage in Revelation highlight the fate of those who were not found in the book of life. But the next two chapters of Revelation reveal the fate of those whose lives were given over to God. The new Jerusalem, the presence of God Himself, the tree of life, the end of pain. And chapter 21 is interesting for a couple of statements. The great descriptions of the new Jerusalem are there to expand on the thing that gives the city its light. The glory of God. The resurrection at the end of time is awaiting all of us. And it is an absolute certainty, as certain as death is now. What happens afterwards is a source of great hope for us because it will bring God glory. Your life is in His hands. The lives of your loved ones are in His hands. And one of the major points of His coming into the world was to bring God glory through conquering death. Not just the death that held Lazarus and will eventually claim us all, but death on a much larger scale. Hebrews 2, he shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery to a fear of death. Jesus has the power over life and death. And that power gives him the opportunity to bring God glory both through my death and through my eventual resurrection to life. Your loved ones who gave their lives to Jesus, their death is not a permanent state of affairs, but it's a temporary moment leading to the reinvigorating of their bodies, to be reunited with their spirits, changed into something entirely and physically immortal and to live forever in the glory of God. Amen. And this is what gives power to the statement in 1 Corinthians. So when this corruption shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Jesus has power over my death too. And I'm terribly unlikely to be raised back to life like Lazarus. But that doesn't diminish Jesus' power. 
the glory of the resurrection life that comes through that power will bring God glory forever. Let's pray. Jesus, with your disciples, we say, teach us to pray. And with your disciples, we learned that prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And so with your disciples, we pray this prayer that you taught them. And with your disciples, we continue to say, teach us to pray. Teach us to connect with you. That our prayers do not become a rote thing. A thing with low expectations. But rather, a connection to the most powerful person there is. You. Oh God, in our prayers this morning, in our prayers this evening, in our ongoing connection to you, in the service that we that we do in your name. In the time that we devote to you. In learning about you, in being with you, in speaking with you, in sharing your word. Father, please receive glory. For yours is the kingdom, and yours is the power, and yours is the glory, and we would not take any of it. Teach us how to divert all the glory to you. How in our humility, being like Christ, in embracing even service to death, may we divert glory to you. giving you everything that belongs to you because everything does belong to you. And while sometimes we try to hold things back for ourselves, remind us that we too belong to you. And anything we hold for ourselves, you take anyway. And so let us give it to you freely. May you receive the glory in our lives like Mary and Martha, in our grief. Like Lazarus and in that eventual life that you will give back to us. And like all the people around who saw what happened and believed in you. Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. In Jesus' name. This morning, it is a great pleasure of mine to introduce to you Nigel Fulmore-Smith. In the classical world, what was that? I didn't see it. I got bad, oh, I see. I got a bad eye. <laughs> is he giving me bunny ears or something? I... <laughs> In the classical world, there were four standard virtues that were, that were recognized by everybody. Wisdom, self-control, justice, and courage. And this is a man who has demonstrated to all of us his courage. I mean, let's face it. This man, how, how far did you drive? It was about 10 hours. And, and the Mason-Dixon line is a really big <laughs> jump, isn't it? That's another hour by itself, right? So here he is, after 10 hours of driving and, and saying goodbye to your mom mm -hmm. and, and leaving. Did you see your girlfriend up in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Yeah, that's, good. <laughs> that's good. That's good. But here he is. He's here at the call of God, at, the, at your invitation, 
and I just wanted to introduce him to you. You're going to have a chance to talk with him for a few minutes out in the lobby. Please yep. just bend his ear all over the place. Yep. And I'm going to invite the worship team to come up and let's sing some more. Welcome. going to sing a couple more songs. Let's, let's stand for the rest of this service. Oh Lord, we thank you. You gave it all for us. You gave it all. Jesus gave it all. Died, was buried, and then raised and glorified. But somehow, you had it into your heart to invite us and to adopt us as sons and daughters, to give us an amazing inheritance as part of the kingdom of God, to join with you, to come alongside you as sons and daughters. Oh, Lord, we thank you. Right from the very start. Does it make 
makes sense but what I You've given us so much, oh God. We just want to reflect you. We want to make you known. We want to glorify you. Oh Lord, as we go today, be magnified in our lives. We're creation, suddenly articulate. With a thousand tongues to lift one cry, then from north to south and east to west, we hear Christ be magnified. We're the whole earth. We're the whole earth echoing His ever. His name would burst from sea and sky, from rivers to the mountain tops. We hear Christ be magnified. Sing it all, Christ be magnified. Let Christ be magnified in me and oh Christ be magnified from the altar of my life Christ be magnified in me Still 
You are dismissed. Go in peace.